Have you ever wondered if you can mix the paints from two different paint makers in one painting? The short answer is heck yeah, and you need to do it soon. The slightly longer answer is there are a few things to consider before you do. And while I paint these gorgeous, juicy, fun, sunny, sunshine oranges today, I'm gonna tell you all about it. So you need to consider three things when thinking about mixing palettes from different manufacturers. Number one, organization. Number two, memory. Number three, longevity. Now we're gonna get into the painting, so stick around. I'm gonna explain these three details a lot more. Today's supplies, I'm using my Free From Fear brush collection and an Arches Cold Press watercolor block. Of course, the Art For Joy Sake palette, and I'm bringing in my Old Holland palette as well. All right, starting out with that Filbert brush, friends, and I'm heading in with a little orange wet on dry. And this is more like juicy on dry. That color is pretty syrupy. And I'm just making some really casual kind of loose triangles and they don't have any hard edges. Dipping into some other colors here in that warm orange family, just a, a toned down with white peach. And then starting to fill in those triangles but imperfectly, definitely leaving some white space. And notice I'm going around an invisible center. I do that with flowers too. And it really helps think about where the center will be, but without painting it to get your overall shape. So this is kind of a cut down the middle, sliced orange, and I'm viewing it from the top and then going with a perpendicular hold and creating a little border or frame around those shapes that I just created, those triangles, and leaving a little white space in between. And really with orange slices, it's all about the white space, in my humble opinion. It's all about leaving white space exactly where it needs to be to create this convincing slice. Another perpendicular hold here, just a little bit of whatever was on my brush, and I'm pulling in a little peach and the fluorescent from my palette and filling that in the middle. Again, perpendicular hold, another quick circle with whatever's left on my brush, and I'm doing that a few times over. I really think using the paint that's left on your brush and letting it run out is just such an underused technique in watercolor because the effects you can get are so cool. Now let's take a look at that again as I explain the first detail that you really need to consider if you're mixing two palettes. So organization. Basically, you need to decide, are you gonna mix on the palettes that you're using and kind of intermingle the paints from one palette and another, or are you gonna use a dedicated mixing tray? I am a free spirit, you know this about me, friends, but when it comes to mixing palettes, I'm a little more organized because the last thing I want is to be six months down the road in my palette that I used for this mixed palette painting and completely frustrated, can't remember how to mix what I mixed there, not remembering that, yeah, you get where I'm going here. So organization really helps eliminate future frustration when you use these palettes for a new piece of art. My recommendation would be to use a separate mixing dish of some kind and go ahead, add a little piece of tape on the bottom of it and even label what mixture was in there so you could use it later on. Or you could just be crazy like me in this video and just mix on both palettes and then just clean up your mixing trays after the painting session and eliminate the potential future frustration along with with a little bit of paint. Let's get back into painting these beautiful oranges. I am just layering, once I've got the basic shapes down here, layering on top some more intense color. It's a kind of a wet on damp situation. And if you don't know what I mean by wet on damp, I'm gonna link a video below for you. Switching over to my quarter inch dagger with a little bit of a darker orange, going into the corners of some of those soft triangles in the first orange slice and just darkening them up, adding a little bit of depth. I was using the tip of my brush there, the tip of that quarter inch dagger, which comes to such a lovely point. Now, press, drag, and lift the flat side of the brush facing down the paper, and double that stroke, press, drag, and lift with a different color right next door to create that gorgeous two-tone leaf. And let's repeat kind of curving out and up a little bit ever so slightly and going right over top just the underside of that leaf with a darker green and that is also wet on wet that second stroke 
and just repeat the press drag and lift throughout a little cluster of three over here on the left one of the leaves being obviously bigger and the other two a bit smaller i love clusters of odd numbers of anything especially leaves they just look more natural and organic to the eye and then i just grabbed a dirty brush full of whatever was on my mixing palette there and started to add in some filler leaves here especially on the left look at the descending size of those leaves as you go out towards the left edge of the paper and it looks like just a full little vine of loveliness and i'm all about it now take that dirty paint on your brush and add some little dots those are kind of the the little dimples what do you what do we call those the oranges belly button i don't know but you know what i'm talking about you, every orange has one and when you start to add that into each orange things start to look really real in at least in my book trying a different technique here just to fill the page and have fun i created this kind of three quarter circle here going all the way out to the edges with water and then with my half inch dagger i'm just dabbing in some fun saturated color loading those brushes up and at this point friends i am back and forth between both of these palettes i'm gonna try that again at the top i kind of like the way that the paint is moving notice how i'm not filling in that wet circle perfectly and yes you may have noticed i double dipped between the two palettes I'm totally okay with that. It doesn't make me panic, but if it makes you panic, don't do it. Just dip and rinse and dip and rinse and mix on a separate tray or plate. And then I'm adding in that little dimple, that little belly button on the orange and all things are looking just beautiful and natural and lovely. I'm gonna try that wet first technique with the leaf here. I love this blue from my old Holland palette. Friends, if you don't know, I am this year going through the journey of swatching, finally swatching my entire collection of watercolors. The old Holland will certainly be part of that. If you wanna see what I've done so far, I'm going to link below some of my swatching videos. Just more press drag and lift here, loading up the brush with a different color green each time I go back to the palette. Now I've got a soft peach. I rinsed my brush though before I touched on that soft peach or it just would have been a holy hot mess. And I'm just creating a little kind of slice of an orange here, very abstract. So basically it's like a little moon or a little smiley face. And then I'm gonna repeat that. This one looks like a little hill or a little frowny face. And uh, yeah, just dabbing in a little bit of color when the page is damp and letting it flow. I'm not overworking the color on the page here too much at all. I'm letting gravity and the air circulation in the room take over. Now I've decided to make that a whole orange, that little slice, I don't know, I wasn't feeling the shape of it, so I decided to make it a whole orange. And friends, just notice how I am adding color, I'm dabbing, I'm splotching the color on, I'm scrubbing the color on, but I am not spending too much time in any one given space. I'm already thinking ahead to like what I want this piece to feel like and look like, and I definitely am feeling a background coming on, which means I'm not gonna let the white space necessarily hang out and be obvious throughout this entire painting. And that's kind of because I'm really loving the way that as I fill this page with leaves, I love that contrast from the greens of the leaves, the teals and the turquoise, and how they are laying against and next to the orange of the fruit. And so because I love that so much, I'm like, yeah, I think I wanna really push that and bring in a dark and moody watercolor background. So stick around to see how that turns out. Now, I don't normally do this, meaning I don't normally go fully to the edge of a painting or a watercolor paper, whatever you wanna call it. But this time around, I'm just feeling the itch to go all the way to the edge and play with composition in regards to that. A Couple of things you wanna think about in terms of composition when you're going fully to the edge or just composition in general is that you wanna make sure that your eye has a path, a pathway of moving around the page. 
Because if your eye can follow around the page, start in a really strong area, your focal point, and kind of land back at that focal point, you know that you're doing a good job in terms of composition. But if your eye starts at the focal point and then kind of gets stuck down in a corner, let's say, then maybe you have a little bit more work to do and things to add and things to adjust. So for example, right now, when I'm looking at this composition, I start at the center. I do believe that my, my slide of orange there at the center that I'm working on right now is my focal point but very quickly my eye travels upward to the top middle and then it starts coming down around the right side and my eye gets stuck where my hand is right now at the bottom right corner because that bottom right corner is such a strong visual area that big orange and then the really strong turquoise leaf right on top of it so I know I have some work to do in this composition to keep my eye kind of moving from that bottom right hand corner and keep on going so just a little thought on composition there for you and if you want more in-depth information about my ideas of composition and how it works best I'm going to link a video below now I've been working on that focal point slice of the orange and I've actually been using the lifting technique I have two lifting techniques they're self-named normal lifting which I didn't invent don't get me wrong Normal lifting is to correct a mistake. An area is too dark, an area is too intense, an area needs a little bit of blending, and you lift to remove color. Then I have a technique that I have coined positive lifting. And it's really just so you think about lifting in a different way, where you're lifting to actually create a highlight. You're not actually trying to correct a mistake, you're trying to add more texture, more oomph, more something, something to the painting by using the lifting technique. So if you wanna know more about positive lifting and all of my other crazy spins on traditional watercolor techniques, you guessed it, I'm gonna link it below. Now friends, you know what I'm gonna ask. You know what I'm gonna ask if you're enjoying yourself and you're enjoying this orange sunshiny awesomeness of a session together, go ahead and give this video a boop. Now you might ask, what's a boop? A boop is a like, friends. Go ahead and give this video some love. It helps others find this channel and of course we want them to join this community and the conversation. Now speaking of conversation, let me know what your favorite part of this painting is so far. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, my favorite part is that box bottom right corner, even though it's messing with my compositional juju right now, the bottom right hand corner with that big orange and that turquoisey tealy leaf above it. Mm, chef's kiss, love it. Heading in now with that same wet first clean water technique, adding some kumquat size orange shapes here and then dabbing on uh, fluorescent yellow, medium yellows, and some oranges. Now friends, you might wonder, why doesn't she call out actual pigment names? I never do, it's not my thing, I have a bad memory, but also and more importantly, I believe that you should just use what you have. I don't want you worrying about using the same exact colors that I have. I want you to worry about just painting. It's all about just painting. Use what you have, use what you love. Now I'm continuing to add more kumquat size oranges here and I'm kind of letting them trickle down in the area, almost like a vine of kumquats. And now I'm gonna connect them with little stems and that curved edge of my dagger brush. And as I connect the stems, I'm adding a few simple press, short drag and quick lift leaves and that short drag quick lift is going to give you just a simple classic medium sized leaf that is so perfect for these smaller filler moments just lovely look at that isn't that gorgeous and that really is actually helping my focal point bringing more interest to that kind of just left of center focal point that i have going on moving up to the upper left corner here press drag and lift twice right next door to one another with that half inch dagger. I've got just a nice olive green. Now I'm adding a little bit of like a cobalt turquoisey shade and again going off of the page completely. And I just love, love, I, I'm just, these greens, the, the my old Holland uh, palette here is full of some of the most luscious greens, friends, and you're just gonna have to wait to find out which colors they are exactly, the pigment names, because that's just for another video. But if you are curious and you are excited about my swatching video, my swatching journey in the upcoming weeks and months, go ahead and let me know below in comments. Just say yes, swatching, or just let me know somehow that you're excited about the swatching, or maybe you're not. You can let me know that too. 
Moving on to the background, and this is how we do it. This is how we do it. Yeah, you know if I'm excited about what I'm working on, I do tend to break into song, so I apologize in advance and for all future moments. Uh, friends, I am going in with a dark blue. Use what you have, use what you love. This is kind of like a Prussian-ish blue, and I am just working into the white space or the negative space. Once that blue is down, I'm adding a little bit of water to kind of flood out that color. Notice right there how I just added a stroke of the dark blue, rinsed my brush, and then went in with that damp brush and smoothed that blue out into the rest of the white space. And that's the general technique of my kind of wash and fill type backgrounds. I add some color, I wash it out into the space. I often leave a white margin, a little bit of white space between the background and the actual oranges in this case. And that's really it. Now you could wash out that blue color with a clean brush or as I'm doing right now, my clean brush loaded with the fluorescent green and oof, Look at that gorgeous ombre of color. So just another way to add more interest to your background. It doesn't have to be just one color used throughout. All right, it's clearly time for me to take a break and just paint. And it's time for you to just watch and see how this background unfolds and finishes. But be sure to stick around friends because the detailing is coming soon. Before we get into the detail work of this painting, I wanna talk about memory. And this was the second detail that I wanted you to think about if you're mixing palettes. So this is pretty simple. If you have a bad memory like me, I just want you to make a note on the back of your painting which two or three or more, or however many palettes you used on this particular painting, just make a note on the back reminding yourself. So six months down the road, a year down the road, you don't have to try to remember, you just know. All right, gonna wrap up this bad boy with two different brushes. I'm going to be using my liner brush, Remember Joy brush, and I'm gonna be using my brand new triple zero detail brush. So excited about this little bad boy. I have a little bit of red on my palette. I'm just gonna go in and add some of those, what do we call them, veins or I don't know, but you know what I'm talking about in a sliced orange. You've got all those little crevices and yeah, we're just adding those in little wiggly thin lines and letting that become our simple detail to just add a little pop to these gorgeous, washy, sunshiny, happy oranges. 
heading into the non-sliced oranges and around that orange's belly button or dimple, whatever it's called. Somebody head in the comments, let me know what it's actually called. I'm adding a few little dots and dashes with that, that red that I have mixed on the palette and I'm working throughout. Now, I'm not treating each orange the same. I'm not making sure that the dots and dashes are placed in exactly the same spot every orange because I want there to be variety and interest. So just keep that in mind. And that's another compositional thing that is so powerful when you're adding detail, when you're adding moments to make sure that they vary because you know what? Nature varies and no two oranges are ever the same. Heading back into that focal point sliced orange with more of that red, I've got it loaded heavier on the brush and I'm continuing to add the detail. Notice how the detail or the veins, whatever they're called, are emanating or kind of radiating back to or radiating from the center of the slice. And that really helps kind of with the realism. Now, obviously this isn't a realistic painting, but we want it to definitely be easily and quickly recognizable as an orange slice. So that's what I'm talking about when I say realism in this context. As I continue to paint here, friends, how do we feel about mixing palettes? Is it something you do often? Is it something you shy away from? And I'd love to know the whys behind both responses. Head into comments and let me know. And you know what? While we're at it, I'll go ahead and give this video a boop, friends. That's a like. It really helps me out. Now, grabbing my beloved liner brush and just grabbing that dark blue from whichever palette is closest to my hand and going in and adding those linear details that are such a part of my personal style. Now, maybe you don't like that contrast that I've got. It's, a, it's really obvious dark against the light leaf there in the upper right hand corner. You can just use a lighter blue or a lighter green, meaning adding more water so you have less contrast if that's more of your vibe. But you know me, uh, more is more type of gal. I love contrast. And the same applies here. I am not approaching each leaf that I'm adding detail to in the same way. Notice how I might be finishing both sides of the leaf coming out from that central vein. And sometimes I'm just doing one side and definitely varying the space between each vein. And yeah, that just keeps things interesting. Oof, I still really love that bottom right hand corner and I love it even more now after adding the detail. I'm using that same dark blue to go ahead and further detail the little dimples in those oranges. And yes, it's blue. And you're like, why would you use blue? And because again, I like contrast. If you want less contrast, don't use a dark blue or an indigo like I am. Use a darker red or a darker orange or add a little brown. But for me, I'm a color lover and the more opportunity I have to add interesting color, I will use it. And it doesn't really read as blue, does it? It doesn't heading back in to that orange slice and adding a watered down version of that blue. It's honestly just my dirty brush that I haven't rinsed thoroughly with a little bit of that bright orange from my old Holland palette loaded on top. And I'm using that kind of muddy orange to continue detailing throughout. Muddy colors can be so powerful. And really, should we call them muddy colors? Yeah, we should, because I wanna kind of flip the switch on the word muddy. Toned down, muted, they're muddy. But muddy colors give your painting a chance to breathe visually. If everything were bright and bold and colorful, it would be less interesting and honestly harder to look at. So these moments where you use toned down or muddy colors really help your composition and the overall kind of experience that the viewer has with your painting. Now I've been adding a lot of little dot and dash type detailing here, but I will often decide to go over some of the areas that I feel need a softening with a clean brush or a damp brush and just soften some of those areas like I'm doing right here where it allows the texture that I've added to still shine through, but it just tones it down and softens it a little bit. So think about that. Are there areas of detail that you've added to this point 
that you feel could be softened by a clean, damp brush. Heading back in with my detail brush and adding some simple dots of a red. And you're like, I can barely see them. That's kind of the point. I love just little touches like this towards the end of a painting that aren't super in your face, but that add just a little bit of like visual interest, a little bit of noise, if you will, to a painting in areas. As I continue in this painting, let's touch on that last detail that I want you to consider when you're mixing palettes in one work of art, and that's longevity. You, you might be mixing quality of paint here, to be honest. You're gonna be mixing light fastness ratings, and so a really key moment when mixing palettes is just to consider that you're gonna need to plan and then protect your final works of art. And honestly, that's the case with any work of art, is just make sure that if you are planning to gift this piece or you're storing this piece to store it away, away from direct light, or if you're gonna be framing it, use UV protecting glass. And in addition, I love to use a UV protectant spray that really just gives that added layer of protection. Last but not least here is this unexpected addition of these bright red little I don't know what they are. Are they berries? Are they just like kumquats in the distant background? I just thought it would be fun. It just popped into my head. So I'm adding these bright red, like half and quarter and three quarter circles. And honestly, I'm so glad I did because against all of the yellows and the oranges in this painting, this kind of corally red is really bringing everything to life. And the painting is now kind of, vibrating or sparkling a little bit. Is, does that make sense? Do my descriptions make sense? I hope they do. I'm glazing over top with fluorescent yellow in areas. Glazing is basically going over top of an area that is dry with a sheer layer of another color. And the end result is a third color. And glazing is fantastic. And it is definitely a technique that if you're not familiar with, you need to be. This next video where I teach you how to create realistic-ish tulips is gonna be a perfect follow-up and is gonna give you everything you need to know about glazing. And until next time, friends, I wish you so much happy, sunny, joyful, awesomeness kind of painting.